The Tom Woods Show, episode 1646. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, in school, we got a sanitized, upside-down version of the history of the U.S. presidents. Well, I'm going to bring you the real history. Check it out at freehistorycourse.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Dave Smith is back. Dave is host of Part of the Problem, the other libertarian podcast you should be listening to. And then after that, you're 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 good. You're you're pretty much good. Now I'll get a passive aggressive email from Bob Murphy, no doubt, uh, in a few minutes. But anyway, I'm glad to have Dave back on here. His comedy special, uh, Libertas, you should go get because it's probably the only comedy special you'll have from Dave for a little while while we wait to be allowed to sit in venues again. Uh, but it's it's super terrific. It did extremely well. And Dave's star just continues to rise. And I'm glad to have him back. Dave, how's it going? Very good, Tom. As always, good to be with you. I appreciate the kind words. And I'm not familiar with this Bob Murphy fellow, but I'll have to check him out. Yeah. I mean, he's, I don't know, he's a historian or I don't know. He's got a degree in something. But what I want to ask you about first, before we even get into our topic, is are you still in exile from New York City? I am indeed. I have, uh, I've been across the, uh, the river for basically this whole thing, just kind of camping out in, uh, in my in-law's house. So I've, uh, I've, I've avoided, I've gone back a few times, but uh, yeah, I've been out of New York City for most of the craziness. Are you obsessively following developments there in terms of hints as to what the plan is in the months to come? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I've, I've been obsessively following this whole thing because I, you know, it, it's while infuriating, it's pretty fascinating and it's a real moment in history that we're living through. But yeah, I have no idea what the, the future of, of New York City is going to be like, and I'm not optimistic about it. And as, as I said from the very beginning of this thing, I've always been, I mean, I, I was certainly concerned with the virus at first, but I've always been more concerned with the crazy response to it. And I think now, particularly with de Blasio in there, who has dug his heels into the lockdown being the greatest thing that was ever done, um, I don't know. I don't know if they're if they're ever going to have a true opening. You know, I, I don't know what the, the next two years is going to look like. Well, look, the thing that makes New York worth living in is culture. That That's mainly it. That's what draws people there. Maybe it's sporting events, but that's mostly for people who live there already. But it's precisely the museums, the the Broadway theater, the, the concert venues, all these sorts of things bring people in from long distances. It's not the congestion, the noise, the, the filth. Those things are still going to be there. The spacious homes, the uh, yeah, yeah the it's cheap... not the spacious homes. It's <laughs> not the cheap real estate per square foot or anything, anything like that. So if they're not planning to open, uh, okay, I mean that's one approach they could take. But at some point, it means people stop visiting, and at another point, it means people start moving away, and they yeah. have to. I mean, at some point, even the craziest authoritarian has to factor that in. Yeah, well, what'll happen at a certain point, and and you've seen kind of already from from the lockdowns across the country that uh, working people have been decimated, uh, small businesses, mid sized bi- mid sized businesses have been decimated, and that really means absolutely nothing to the political class and the media and and all of them. They they really don't care. But what's gonna start to happen is that this is actually gonna start to be very bad for big business and very bad for uh, cities, and that I think will get their attention a little bit more. I want to get to our topic in just a second, but I'm sure people will excuse us for this uh, diversion here because we've never lived through anything like this. The silver lining, it's not a silver lining. Silver lining means there's a good side to it. I guess what I mean is with this virus, we have one advantage, I'll put it that way, that we had no right to expect, which is that for the most part, we can pinpoint the most vulnerable demographic. There, we had no right to expect that that would be the case. It's just good fortune that we can identify more or less the, the – now, I know that you talk to people on Twitter and they say, but I know some guy who died when he was 43. 
I know that, but remember how you guys are supposed to be for the science? You can't <laughs> answer a statistic with an anecdote, okay? That's like, that's not even science 101. They don't let you into science 101 if you're still pulling that. So the pro-science people are terrible. They, they give you stuff like this. For the most part, we do know who the vulnerable are, and we know a vastly disproportionate number of these deaths have occurred not just among the elderly population, but in nursing homes specifically. That's where half the deaths in Stockholm happen, where everybody's saying, oh, there are so many deaths in Sweden. Yeah, half of them in Stockholm are in larger than normal nursing homes, uh, nursing homes that are larger than in other Scandinavian countries. You factor that out, because that's just random that it happens to find its way into a nursing home, and suddenly the world changes. So it seems like it shouldn't be that hard to say we just protect the vulnerable people. And then they say, oh, but every you know you, when you go home to see your grandmother, uh, well, okay, so then you 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 got to be super careful. But then there's also the fact that we were told in January that asymptomatic people could uh, transmit this virus to, to other people because of a paper that came out of China. And uh, Dr. Fauci said, well, we didn't know if asymptomatic people could be uh, carriers and transmit it to people, but now we know. And then it turned out everybody admitted this paper was totally flawed. Fauci says, well, I still think it's possible for it to be transmitted. Now the WHO is saying it's the likelihood of you winding up with the virus as a result of coming into contact with somebody who has it but is showing no symptoms, is very low. So the idea that I'm just inadvertently walking around and accidentally infecting 10,000 people seems to be less likely than we thought before. But at the same time, who really knows? And, and I'm sorry, I, mean, I know, I, we have to get onto our topic. I, I, I know, I, we'll, we'll get there. But here's the thing, we're told about we gotta follow the science, right? We gotta follow the science. But even the scientists themselves they, uh, usually don't use that phrase. The scientists themselves are more humble than the science, the amateur armchair scientists, because the, the real scientists know that science is evolving. Science is a series of tentative propositions that could be overturned by new evidence. So we don't know a lot of questions about how the virus is transmitted, how it's not transmitted, whether children can transmit it or not. Even that's been questioned. Now the WHO is saying that Sweden, by avoiding a lockdown, is a model that we should follow. I, who even knows what's going on? And then the experts are saying, well, yeah, don't you worry. Almost like they're dying to punish Japan. Don't you worry. There's going to be a big outbreak in Japan because they, they've been really irresponsible. Okay. And then weeks and weeks and weeks later, there's no outbreak. So who am I supposed to listen to? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, exactly. And of course, they, they want everybody says follow the science until the science indicates something other than what they've been pushing for. And, you know, it you start to get into this pattern, right? And th this is one of the really dangerous things about the position we're in now. Like, I, I remember just a, like a comparison. I remember watching this uh, documentary about abortion with, uh, with my wife. A little bit of a weird thing to sit down and watch, but we watched this thing. It was on Netflix, and it was coming very much from the pro-choice position. And there was this uh, abortionist, this abortion doctor who was on there who had been an abortion doctor for like 30 years. And she was saying, she goes, there is absolutely no moral uh, issue with performing an abortion. It's a legal right. And, and there's no moral issue with it. And it's like, well, yeah, you better feel that way because you've been an abortionist for 30 years. So if you were to even entertain the idea that there's some moral question there, you might end up being a serial baby murderer. You know what I mean? So now you kind of have to just, so once you've, the, the point I'm making is once you've done a lockdown, once you're one of these governors or mayors who's insisted on this, you better justify this no matter what the science says. Because otherwise, if it turns out that Sweden really didn't have much of a worse problem uh, than, than other countries did, then you have to realize that you just kicked what's going to end up being between 40 and 50 million people out of work. You just destroyed lives, ruined people's, you know, like human experiences and memories and didn't allow families to see each other. And, and so now they have to dig their heels in and defend this no matter what. So even if all of the science ends up pointing to the fact that this really isn't as bad as, as we feared and the lockdown wasn't necessary – they're, of course, we all know they're going to say, no, no, that was because of the lockdown and just pat themselves on the back for it. So it's we're in a dangerous place. Yeah, that's why we need the definitive uh, book on this that gathers all the, uh, the data, because it turns out that actually if you look at the states 
and you plot it all out as to states that lock down, states that lock down harder than other states, states that lock down sooner than other states. So you plot down the timing of the lockdowns, the severity of the lockdowns, and then you look at the health results. The result is completely random. Yeah. There is no order to it. So it, it, it seems like this virus is more complicated than people want to admit. Everybody wants to have a quick glib answer that can be summarized in one sentence. You look at that scatter plot and there's no glib answer that comes out of it, except we don't know what's going on here. Yeah, no, a- absolutely. So, all right, now let's let's uh, uh, switch gears here. I want to talk to you about Justin Amash, the congressman from Michigan, who's now changed parties. He left the Republican Party some time ago, and now he's joined the Libertarian Party officially. He has launched a so-called exploratory committee to think about running for, for president. Uh, obviously, that means he's running for president. I don't even know this whole exploratory committee thing. <laughs> everybody does it because they feel like they have to. But come on, I mean, just say what you want to what you want to say. And I've seen a lot of libertarians get very excited about that because this means we would have a high profile person. He's not just a U.S. congressman, but he's a U.S. congressman a lot of people know about because he certainly was in the news quite a bit uh, as a result of the impeachment proceedings. And he has gotten a reputation for himself over the years as being, to some degree, more or less in the Ron Paul camp. He's said nice things about Ron Paul. He's been, uh, by and large, against foreign intervention. He's willing to talk about the Fed. Uh, He's anti-drug war. He's got a lot of things going for him. And he, you know, he comes across as a, you know, he's telegenic, he might, he's not the world's most exciting guy. I mean, I don't think anybody would dispute that he's uh, on the boring side. But, you know, he's a respectable face for the libertarian message. That's the case that I think people are making for Amash. What are your impressions? Now, neither one of us is the world's foremost expert on his record. I've followed him to some degree. But I just want to know um, of what you do know about him and your instincts. What is that telling you? Well, I mean, I want to be fair to the guy. And so he certainly is one of the better congressmen uh, out there. He's He's been pretty good on uh, budgetary issues, on foreign policy, um, on the war on drugs, as you mentioned. I mean, I, look, I think he's got to be like top five uh, congressmen in terms of his voting record. And if there were 535 Justin Amashes in, in Congress, I, I think the country would be in a lot better shape. Um, and, uh, you know, so yeah, he's, he's certainly not bad. And I understand where, uh, some people, even the, the kind of LP, uh, establishment who I have been very critical of, and you have too at times, um, I, I understand why they would be excited about him coming over. Uh, certainly you're guaranteed a lot of uh, national press, a lot of coverage that you may not get with some of the other candidates. I saw uh, Adam Kokesh tweeted earlier today that all the people uh, that were supporting Amash were saboteurs. And, you know, I don't really think that's fair uh, to to try to give the guy his due. He's got some good uh, qualities to him. And there's, I, I understand where, uh, you know, people in the party get excited over the idea of, oh, look, we got a sitting congressman now and, and having the title congressman, uh, makes people take you a little bit more seriously. So I don't, um, I don't think that he is entirely without his merits. Yeah. I, I, that's, that's more or less how I feel, uh, about him. Now, at the same time, I'm not as enthusiastic about him as other people. And if I say that, I already, I already know what the response is. I already know because without listening to me, they'll say, ah, you know, it's just a libertarian purity test and Woods can never be satisfied and, and some people are just always going to be. Yeah, I know. I, I already know what, I already know you're going to say that. So can you just not bother? <laughs> you know, just save us both some time. And then people will say, how come you were, you know, you would write favorable things about Tulsi Gabbard, who's atrocious on a lot of domestic issues. And yet, you're much tougher on Gary Johnson or, you know, other people. And the answer I give to that is I expect libertarians to be libertarians. I don't expect non-libertarians to be libertarians. So when they occasionally do something that surprises me, I find that worth talking about. But obviously I hold libertarians to a higher standard. I I would hope so. I would hope anybody would. Like occasionally you might find a Democrat who says something sensible that, 
yeah, if a Republican said it, you'd say, well, that's the least of what you should say. You shouldn't get excited about that. But if a Democrat says it, sure, why not? That's exactly been my my position. Now, when it comes to Amash, I feel like I watched his interview on, on MSNBC, and I think that was maybe the first one he did after announcing, and I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 1646. And this was very unimpressive. If this is the tone of his campaign, it's very, very unimpressive. Yeah, uh, it was, I agree. Yeah, I just want to give people another choice. You, you watched that? Yeah, I watched that, and I also watched his uh, appearance on Meet the Press, which is kind of like the big show, uh, you know, the, like the longest running uh, news show and all that stuff. And it was equally unimpressive. And the thing that I, I think libertarians should be concerned about is like, you have to ask yourself, this is was at the heart of my whole debate with uh, uh, Nick Sarwak and, and some of the stuff I've been talking about since I've become a member of the LP. You have to ask yourself, what is the goal here? What are we trying to accomplish? And too many times I think people are are thinking about, well, getting a, a higher national profile or getting more votes or something along those lines. But just ask yourself, what does that actually do for us? What does it matter if we get 4 million or 3 million votes or 100,000 votes? Now, I know some people can say, well, it helps the down ballot you know, candidates in the LP or it helps them get more funding or easier ballot access or something like that. But I mean, I, I don't know about you, Tom. Well, I kind of do know about you, but I, I don't know what we really think the odds are that the Libertarian Party is going to start electing so many down-ballot candidates that we're going to get into government, take it over, start repealing things, start you know uh, throwing a wrench in the wheel of, of new spending proposals or something like this. I mean, this sounds to me like perhaps a 100-year project at best. And I don't really think that should be the libertarian goal. I think our goal should be to wake as many people up as we possibly can. Um, and and that is not going to be accomplished by these Justin Amash interviews, by going out and saying, well, I, you know, I think they sh- there should be a third option or, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like Trump and Biden. So now you're going to get what Gary Johnson got. You're going to get protest votes. And what what did that do? I mean, between me and you, Tom, we've done more to recruit for the Libertarian Party than Gary Johnson's three or four million votes or whatever did. So uh, again, my concern isn't even really recruiting for the Libertarian Party. My concern is waking up a lot of people. If if Libertarians are going to have any type of success going forward, it would seem pretty obvious to me that we need a lot more Libertarians. And seeing as how just about everybody listening to this show, myself included, um, was once not a Libertarian, and then was was woken up. Um, probably there's a, there's other people who we can do that for, and you don't do that by by not presenting any uh, you know like a coherent worldview and and something that's radically different from the typical politics that people see all the time. Like it, you know one of the things um, it, it, when I was debating Nick Sarwalk that he said um, was he said you know you don't convert people. Um, by asking them to eat the apple all at once. You have to convert them slowly by giving them little bits, like maybe you're on gun rights. Well, we're at the same position on you on gun rights or, or gay rights or the war on drugs or something like this. And I, I said, I, I responded to him and I said, well, I mean, who have you ever converted? I've converted way more people over to this cause than you have. And and what empirical evidence is there? It, it all points in the opposite direction. Who converted people to this movement? Well, Ron Paul did. He was the purest libertarian that's ever run for office. Uh, it, um, Ayn Rand did. She was certainly not moderate when it came to, um, you know, like uh, talking about her worldview. And even Milton Friedman or someone like that. Milton Friedman didn't convert people by writing about his monetary policy or, or talking about, you know, the negative income tax or school choice or something like that. Milton Friedman, uh, you know, convinced people with his free to choose uh, series and and with his Donahue appearances, where he presented a coherent worldview that's different than anything people have been exposed to before. And so, I just think for the prospects of liberty, that is obviously our best bet. 
And Justin Amash just doesn't seem to even be trying to do that. Well, let me give a few examples of, of what I have in mind. I mean, especially right now. But you're, I mean, you're right. This is a long program. If, if, if what these people have in mind of uh, we'll gradually change a few minds here and there by, by being reasonable and nice. All right. Well, you know, see you in 2120 <laughs> when you've right. made no progress. I want a libertarian candidate to be radically distinct from the other two and not just say, well, people want somebody who's honest, who's practical, who's, well, they're going to vote for Joe Biden then because they say, look, he's not Trump either. Just like you, he's not Trump, but he, he'll he have a lot of seasoned Washington people around him and he'll probably be reasonable enough. That's the reasonable caucus is already going to, to Joe Biden. I want somebody who doesn't express himself, frankly, like a boring boomer. Like I look at Amash's Twitter and it's, he tweets out things like, as president, I will protect the entire Bill of Rights. I mean, what, this is like Joe Biden tweeting about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Like, that's your tweet? <laughs> like, I, or, or it's, again, it's, if I look at his, his interviews, it's, I just want to be some, th- people need more options. I want to be another option. For people. No, no, no. Look, I want the libertarian position to be clear. Like when he was interviewed on MSNBC, the interviewer said, well, wait a minute, you're calling for massive payments of money to Americans all over the country. That doesn't sound very limited government to me. And he said, well, it is limited government because the plan we have now is very convoluted. And this would, and, and it goes to a lot of different people. This would really streamline it. And that makes it limited government. That's a confusing message. Or it's not a message delivered by a man whose blood is boiling from moral outrage. Like the problem with our foreign policy is not primarily that the Congress isn't voting on it. You know, it it doesn't matter. The Congress is full of idiots also. I wouldn't feel better about the foreign policy because we had more people voting on it. And that's been his emphasis uh, in the, I mean, if you don't believe me, just look at what he's been saying the last few days. I want somebody who says, look, you want to see what voting for R&D gets you? Look at the war on terror. It's been an absolute disaster from any possible standpoint. And you look at everything. You look at the, the, the housing bust we got. It's always got Democrat and Republican fingerprints all over. I, I don't just want to hear this procedural stuff about we need an honest guy with practical ideas who's going to uh, unite people and he's going to get the consent of everybody before he goes into a ridiculous war. Uh, now, I know I know you can find some anti-intervention things here and there. I'll even leave aside the issue of Iran sanctions where he was not good. But this is not the messaging. Or how hard is it? I'm sorry, I'll stop talking. I'll let you talk. How hard is it for the libertarian candidate to say this shutdown is the worst self-inflicted wound in the history of the world and it's ridiculous and we ought to stop it? Now, he could easily say to me, oh, but that's a governor's decision, not the president. Total cop out. Because if, if Trump is occasionally claiming that he has the power to decide for states, and we know perfectly well that if Biden were in charge, he would lock down the country using executive authority, that makes it a federal issue. The fact that the other two candidates think it is. And all we can get is, well, the governor really should proceed you know, in accordance with the will of the legislature. The, the legislature is full of bums too. But I mean, like that's, the, that's your outrage. And even that, that tiny, tiny little pushback got outrage from the blue check. So if even that's going to get outrage, why don't you do something that actually deserves the outrage and that actually spreads yeah. the idea that we're not just 4% different from the other people? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and I mean, in this moment, to, to not have some type of libertarian message when the, I mean, the situation around us is that the government completely mismanaged the handling of this pandemic. They were giving horrible advice to people like don't wear masks. They slowed down the process of, of producing all of the PPE and all of that stuff. And now you have a situation where the government is, you know, ha- is arresting people for going to a park or to the beach with absolutely no constitutional authority to do so. How how hard is it to come up with a libertarian message for that that resonates with people? I mean, my God, we've got we've got 30 million people who have applied for unemployment insurance in the last month and a half. That's just applying for unemployment insurance. That's that's not the total unemployed people. I, I mean, what the God, and there's no evidence that the lockdown has even helped. And so are, are we really struggling here? What, what's the libertarian uh, uh, message here? Well, I don't know, but it's probably not that temporary UBI would be lower in administrative fees 
than the current bailout system. And and when when you take that position, it's like you're basically saying like, yeah, well, I don't really believe in this stuff, but I guess when push comes to shove, my philosophy doesn't really work. So let's have a, a better violation of libertarian principles than the one we currently have. This this is guaranteed to have no impact whatsoever. And it's certainly not going to wake anybody up and make them think about, you know, the the role of government or or the value of liberty in some radically different way. It's just, it's impossible to inspire anyone with this stuff. I want to read a little passage from an article by Dan McCarthy, whom I have on from time to time. He's the editor of Modern Age. And he had a piece called Justin Amash, A Study in Vanity. And it's at least, and he's called Justin Amash the anti-Ron Paul for a number of reasons. But let, now again, I know there are people who are going to say, oh, I'm never going to listen to Woods again. Well, you know, go go jump in a lake then. You know? <laughs> so I'm supposed to just repeat what you want me to say. I mean, come, you know, go find somebody well, don't, else. Well, don't jump in a lake right now. It's illegal. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I want a candidate who's going to talk about why you should be able to jump in a lake <laughs> if you want to. So- so I already know that, that kind of response I'm going to get. But somebody's got to say this, doggone. Somebody has to say, at the very least, let's pause for a minute here and ask, do we want another message that's going to be delivered the way it was delivered in 2016? Because that's what it's shaping up to be. Or I certainly, oh, wait, come on, just an anti-Trump message? That's the last thing the country needs to hear. The country does not need to hear the system is broken in the sense that we fight and we're too partisan sometimes, but the real problem is Trump. No, the real problem is not Trump. This whole system is the problem. If there was no Trump, we'd still be having a million problems. I, I don't even want to slightly, I don't even want to be misperceived as feeding it. Right. Anyway, here's from Dan's piece. Uh, so why is he running? The immediate explanation is probably that he concluded he couldn't win his race for re-election to Congress. He's younger than Barr or Johnson, and if he wants a future as a pundit, a third-party presidential bid serves him better than a humiliating defeat in his House race. Amash made headlines last year by quitting the GOP and throwing his support behind the Democrats' impeachment effort. He won strange new respect from liberals and neoconservatives, not exactly the fan base of principled libertarian craves, you might think. But since his moment of never-Trump glory, he's been a non-entity. A presidential bid, however futile, will raise his profile. It guarantees him a few more minutes of fame, and because he can be trusted to bash Trump more than Biden, the pro-Biden media, Tara who, will give him a megaphone. A small one, but that's as good as he can get, so he'll take it. Uh, and then another uh, quick uh, paragraph. But it turned out that Amash's self-conscious separation from Ron Paul and the Tea Party was the beginning of a pattern. Again and again, Amash has made a point of pretending to be better than everybody else, especially those who work alongside him. He was too good for the Ron Paul movement, too good for the Tea Party, and ultimately too good for the Republican Party and the House Freedom Caucus. A humbler man might have asked himself why every other Republican, including equally or even more liberty-minded ones such as Kentucky's Thomas Massey, were opposed to impeachment. Your friends and allies might be wrong, but they're presumably your friends and allies in the first place because you think they're generally on the right side. And if you think they're wrong in a particular instance, friendship and loyalty would argue that you should try all the harder to convince them to change and not simply break off the relationship. But Amash isn't about persuasion. He's about preening his own feathers. Now, I don't ever hear Dan really talk that way. I mean, Dan is a very reserved, scholarly type. Uh, but that's his assessment. I mean, is that too harsh? What do you think? Um, no, I don't think it's too harsh. I think uh, it's, it's actually very fair. And in the spirit of being fair, I do want to acknowledge, because I've heard a lot of people say um, that this is just Gary Johnson and Bill Weld uh, again. And I would say that that Amash is better than than the Johnson Weld. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree like, with he's, that. He's not Bill Weld, say whatever you say. I mean, Bill Weld passionately believed um, – in the, I believe his terminology was in the bipartisan foreign policy consensus uh, of the post World War II era. So, you know, the worst thing ever. Bill Weld believed in the guy. Bill Weld was a lobbyist for Raytheon. I mean, he he was really he's one of the bad guys. Um, and Gary Johnson was just not up for the task. You know, I, I don't think that Amash would embarrass himself 
the way that Gary Johnson did. He's not going to forget Aleppo or be sticking his tongue out in the middle of an interview or stuff like that. Um, that being said, it is uh, what Justin Amash made his name for was uh, was throwing uh, was going in with impeachment, not even over the impeachment hearings. He supported impeachment after the Mueller investigation, after the Mueller report came out. This is before even Nancy Pelosi was was saying we should impeach Donald Trump. And I'm sorry, as much as some libertarians and, and some libertarians in the LP establishment really got on board with the idea of impeachment. And sure, I mean, we could want to impeach every you know political leader. There is a real problem there from a libertarian perspective. And this isn't the same thing as even the Bill Clinton impeachment feel, however you feel about that one. It's not like, oh, Donald Trump committed a crime like the way Bill Clinton did. And OK, it's kind of a petty crime. It was like perjury. But I don't know if you should really be impeached for that or not. There's certainly other things that Bill Clinton deserved to be impeached for. Um, the Donald Trump situation is different. And any libertarian who knows what's going on uh, should know as much. I mean, the, I'm sorry, there was an attempted coup by the FBI and the CIA and the NSA against Donald Trump. And I was saying that from the very beginning, and a lot of people called me crazy, but all of the evidence that's come out since then has basically proven this. I mean, you had Andrew McCabe admitting in 60 Minutes that the Department of Justice was sitting around contemplating the 25th Amendment. And ultimately, they didn't go with that, so they just went with the special prosecutor. This was the plan to get Donald Trump out of office. Look at the new uh, stuff that's come out about what they did to, to Flynn. I mean, this was so in this huge moment where the, the CIA and the FBI decided to overthrow the duly elected president of the United States, Justin Amash sided with the CIA. Now, I'm sorry, I don't know how much I can trust that guy. Uh, this is, it, it would be as if, um, and, and then to say it, what, what he said was that Trump committed obstruction of justice, which even Mueller didn't say. He came up with like 10 episodes that could be considered obstructive in nature. Um, but I'm sorry, that is not the libertarian position. When you are illegally spied on um, and, and, you know, when you have the, the CIA and the FBI uh, deciding they're going to overthrow the president – and and the obstruction of of justice is that he was like tweeting out that it's a witch hunt. I'm I'm sorry. This this would be on the level of if the IRS was auditing uh, somebody and trying to ruin their life, and you know they they claimed that this person had you know like uh, um had given some false numbers on on an income tax receipt or something, and a libertarian to come out and say, well, I think this is reason for that person to go to jail. Because, they, you know, I'm sorry, the IRS are the bad guys and we don't defend them. And by the way, the CIA is a lot worse than the IRS. Uh, these are people who lie us into wars where hundreds of thousands of people get slaughtered. These are very, very bad people. And that that has to be a problem for libertarians that he was, you know, but besides this Corona uh, craziness, this was the biggest story of the last decade. I mean, this was this was an accusation that the sitting president of the United States of America was guilty of treason, that he was involved. He was collaborating with a hostile foreign power. And that turned out to be completely wrong. And what we were looking at was an attempted deep state coup of the duly elected president. That's a big, big moment. And Justin Amash got that completely wrong. So I there's no way that that's not a big problem. Agreed. I, I, again, I just feel like given that you are a U.S. congressman, so you are going to get some media attention. Here's your chance to jolt some people awake. It's not going to win you the election, but doggone it, we got to jolt people awake. And I know all the loser brigade and all the people out there, you know, who – the so funny. Again, our critics, they would die of a thousand deaths before nominating a radical libertarian. It's the last thing they want. Okay, yeah. so the, the thing is they're not actually accusing us of not being libertarian. They really are accusing us of being too libertarian. That is their problem. There's one small issue that I think is revealing, and if I mention it, I'm going to mention it. What's going to happen is uh, the loser brigade will say, ah, Woods doesn't like a mosh because of this. Okay, I'm devoting, let's say, one thirtieth <laughs> of this episode to this topic, uh, but but doesn't matter. That's what they'll say. And that's the transgender issue. Now, if, if Amash had took some anti-libertarian uh, position relating to the transgender people in the sense that he believes that there should be federal civil rights protection 
in employment uh, for them, but he was really great on everything else, I wouldn't care. I mean, it just would not bother me for two seconds. But if he's going to be not the shouting from the rooftops, wake people up, grab them by the collar guy that the times demand right now, then I'm going to nitpick other things too. And the other day he was asked about this. And his answer was, well, we'll take the word in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the word sex, and we can just transform that word so that it will include transgender people. And he says, um, sometimes we have to catch up to the law. Um, and he says, the, the law is written and the law will be fairly broad and the public and the courts are not actually caught up to what is actually in the text. Or basically what we read into the text or write into the text seems to be the, what he's saying there. So look, if you don't like the libertarian message on something, just say it. Just say, this is an area where I disagree with, with libertarians, just so it's not to confuse matters. But that's not a libertarian position to say, well, uh, the federal government should intervene and basically use, initiate physical force against private individuals. And it's so funny because here we have left libertarians are constantly, anytime you and I complain about Facebook, deplatforming somebody, whatever, they'll say, it's a private company. They can do whatever they want. But if Facebook fired somebody on whatever grounds, but the person claimed it was because I'm transgender, because what, what else would they say? We wouldn't get, oh, they're a private company. They could do what they want. We, we'd get, they'd be up in arms. They'd be screaming. And some of them do actually believe in the use of federal power to enforce stuff like this, to, to basically make the labor market a, an impossible thicket of litigation, basically, that for, for everybody to try to deal with. If he can't stand up on this, on this little issue where a lot of the country sees this has gone absurdly too far and talk about being anti-science, this has gone <laughs> absurdly too far, then – I kind of feel like what's, what hope is there for I mean, like I know that's not the be-all and end-all issue, but my point is it's a bellwether. It says something. It indicates if he's not going to stand up on this, well, I don't know. How much can I rely on the guy? Yeah, and and th this is an important libertarian principle. I mean, this is a matter of freedom of association. And now you're going to create a situation where if, um, let's just say, there's uh, some transgender uh, employee who's like, you know, being crazy. Not that there's any link there, There's, uh, but, you know, there's, there's, let's just say you could imagine a situation where one of these transgender people is a little bit uh, nutty. And they end up, you know, doing something crazy and getting fired. Now this business can be sued. Uh, it's it's a mess. This whole thing is, is an absolute mess. And it, it probably uh, will end up having the uh, uh, reverse effect of intended, as a lot of these uh, laws do, is where people are going to almost want to stay away from uh, working with transgender people because they're terrified of, of a lawsuit if they ever had to fire them, which we know has happened with a lot of these other protective rules. So yeah, this is another anti-libertarian position for sure. All right. So the thing people need to do right now is listen to part of the problem. <laughs> that would be my next action step is to listen to your podcast, which I enjoy very much. Somebody asked me recently, what other podcasts do I listen to? And yours was the first one that came up. So Go, for what that's worth, it has the old wood seal of approval. Well, that, so, uh, that warms my heart to hear. I'm glad. I'm glad. GasDigitalNetwork.com is where you can actually become uh, – you can actually you, you can listen to Dave's podcast for free, of course. But if you subscribe over at Gas Digital, you get a lot of, of, of benefits, which incidentally, I don't use any of them. I subscribe just because I want Gas Digital to have some of my money. It doesn't – like it, if they added a million more benefits on there, I wouldn't use any of those either. I just <laughs> want them to have, have my money. So I do that. You guys should do the same. Uh, part of the problem is the name of the podcast. We'll have links up at tomwoods.com slash 1646. And Dave, I'm sorry, you know, I, I talk too much sometimes, but because when I have you and some other people on, because we're friends, it's like we're just talking on the phone. And now the audience knows what it's like to talk to me on the phone. I don't stop talking, <laughs> but I appreciate your good naturedness through it all. Uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely no problem. I love uh, listening to you rant. And as always, it's always uh, great to be on with you, Tom. Thanks again, Dave. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.